Good morning, folks. Welcome to the Leadership Asheville Winter Buzz Breakfast. We're so glad you could join us this morning. My name is Ed Manning. I'm the Executive Director for Leadership Asheville. And my co-host, Katie Cornell, the Executive Director of the Asheville Area Arts Council. Katie, come on up with me. There she is. Good morning, all. We're really glad you guys could join us this morning. We've got a wonderful event. I hope you were able to attend our Buzz Breakfast last month with Mitch Landrew. If not, that recording is on our website. You can look at it at any time. It's uh, leadershipashville.unca.edu. So feel free to join it. We will record today's presentation as well. Want to say thank you to um, our sponsors um, and first and most important, our presenting sponsor, uh, the Van Winkle Law Firm. Let me let me bring up uh, William William Heady from Van Winkle Law Firm. Give me just a second. I'm going to ask him to join me on stage. William is a patent and trademark attorney having experience in all matters related to U.S. and foreign patent uh, preparation and prosecution, trademarks and copyrights. William represents clients in a wide range of industries, including electrical and mechanical component companies, software companies, alcoholic beverage companies, and lots of others. In addition, he's available to assist in matters relating to licensing, cease and desist disputes, and intellectual property due diligence. Please welcome William Haiti. William. Thank you, Ed. Um, in addition to those things, I'm also presently serving as the chair of the uh, business practice group over here at Van Winkle. And I'd be remiss not to mention that we're in the middle of a uh, eight part webinar series on Facebook talking about um, various business topics ranging from legal entity formation to the more fun stuff like um, patents and trademarks. Um, those are every Wednesday at noon um, through the end of March. Um, so we'd love to, love to see you there. Um, my, uh, my colleagues and I certainly uh, cannot wait for the time that we'll all be able to gather together in person, but um, for now we're, we're, we're very happy uh, to have the opportunity to participate um, in this discussion remotely. Um, and we're also thankful to Ed and his team uh, for, for putting this together. Um, it's gone much more smoothly than I would have expected. Um, I'd also like to thank Paul um, for joining us today, uh, I guess from Pennsylvania. Uh, today's topic is, is something I feel that calls for you know, real engagement um, and it's certainly been at the forefront of, of many of our minds for the last uh, several months. Um, but this is something that, um, that, that Paul has you know, been, been, been at for, for more than a decade. So um, yeah, I'm happy to hear his thoughts um, and I hope everyone sticks around for the Q&A. Great, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks again to the Van Winkle Law Firm um, for, for making this possible and all of our sponsors. So it's um, we're really, really very appreciative. Uh, and I also want to uh, let you guys know that I hope you figured out how to move around in Remo. I know this is a new technology for most folks. Um, and, and it's kind of exciting because it gives you a chance to chat with some friends and see some old people. So hopefully you're able to do that. When we go back, this is called presentation mode. So it'll be much like a webinar where you'll be muted and, and microphones and cameras will be off. But you are still seated at your table um, with whoever you were just talking to. And you'll notice that there is a chat function. Uh, and so what we're asking is there's three levels of chat. The general chat, we're asking you not to use. That is for um, administration so we can make announcements. But you can chat with your table or you can chat privately with anybody in the room. So feel free to do that. And as William just mentioned, we have a Q&A tab. Um, and we want to put all the questions in the Q&A tab because our moderators uh, will use that when we get to the Q&A section. And, and you can like questions so that the most important questions will come to the top. So please use that throughout as we go through this. Um, I do want to thank um, a whole lot of other people 
before we get started. And uh, what's wonderful about all of these sponsors, and if you didn't get a chance um, to get around to the sponsors tables, I invite you to do that when we're done. If you click on the banner for each of the sponsors, you will see um, uh, a video or a short message and, and some and further information for each of them. But it's because of our sponsors that we're able to offer this free and open to the public. And we think it's really important that these conversations uh, around equity in our community um, remain free and open to everyone. So um, please take time to, to thank them and go by and see their banners. So certainly the Van Winkle Law Firm, our presenting sponsor, but also a big thank you to Explore Asheville, uh, the Buncombe County Tourism Development Authority and the North Carolina Arts Council, who are also platinum sponsors. Um, our feature sponsors, they all have the banner around the outside of the room. You'll see AB Tech Community College, uh, ABL Technologies, Arby's, Lenore Ryan in uh, University, their Equity and Diversity Institute. Also Rouleau Real Estate, uh, the African Americans in Western North Carolina and Southern Appalachia, and Young Professionals of Asheville. Those are our feature sponsors. So really take time to, afterward to go say hello and thank you to them. They're really important to us. Also, our table sponsors, you'll see them in the middle of the room, the Biltmore, Home Trust Bank, Western Carolina University, and 103.3 Asheville FM. We thank you for your sponsorship and your help in making this happen. Of course, Leadership Asheville wouldn't exist if it weren't for our sustaining partners who contribute to running the whole program all year long, TD Bank, Waste Pro USA, and the Van Winkle Law Firm. So we really appreciate your help with that. And we have community partners, the Blue Ridge Public Radio, uh, Great Line Trolleys, and the YMCA Blue Ridge Assembly, who give us an in-kind donation to make our programs affordable and accessible to many more people. And I would be terribly remiss if I didn't thank our Buzz planning team, who have done a fabulous job with new technology and a really critical topic for us. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Katie Cornell, Susie Chandler, Michael Murray, KP Whaley, and Lauren Yoder. They've done a great job in putting all of this together. So thank you, folks. Now, without further ado, let me turn it over to Katie, who's going to introduce our presenting, uh, our presenter for this morning. Katie? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, and a big thanks to Ed and Jan um, with Leadership Asheville uh, for really uh, all your work on, on helping to pull this together. Um, so I hope you all had a chance to see our first event with Mitch Landrew, where he discussed the removal of Confederate monuments. I'm pleased to share that there will be a follow-up conversation on the Waters and Harvey show in March, so be on the lookout for that. So this month, we pivot slightly and talk about the selection of monuments. With us today is Paul Farber, the director of Monument Lab. Paul is the author of A Wall of Our Own, An American History of the Berlin Wall. He is also co-editor of Monument Lab, Creative Speculations for Philadelphia, a public art and history handbook designed to generate new critical ways of thinking about and building monuments. Paul currently serves as senior research scholar at the Center for Public Art and Space at the University of Pennsylvania's Whiteman Weitzman School of Design and holds a PhD in American culture from the University of Michigan. Without further ado, join me in welcoming Paul Farber. Good morning. Um, thank you so much, um, Ed and Katie um, and everyone else um, uh, who you know made today possible. I'm, I'm coming to you from snowy Philadelphia um, and um, it's really a treat to be here with you. I look forward to um, another time where um, we can be in person and 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 do so advisably. Um, but for now, um, you know, so glad to connect in this way, and and of of course to be in dialogue. Um, I'm going to share my screen because what I'm going to go ahead and do today. Um, go. Um, what I'm going to be doing today, uh, talking more about Monument Lab, talking about the ongoing reckoning and reimagining of monuments across our country, um, and and really try to uh, you know 
have time for conversation and thoughts about what's going on in Asheville, um, in North Carolina, and other places that that you have in mind. Um, and you know, just to to start, um, you know, as I as I've said, you know, Monument Lab um, is a group of people, a collective, um, but really also a movement of folks. We're rooted in Philadelphia, um, that we work around the country and increasingly um, outside of it. And and before I begin, you know, I'm I, as I said, I'm coming from uh, to you from Philadelphia. Um, I want to note a little bit about Philadelphia's history and the kind of terrain from which many of our thoughts kind of emerged when we began with Monument Lab. Um, you know, Philadelphia was a city that was lived in for over 10,000 years by the Lenny Lenape people before it was ever founded um, by English Quakers. Um, it was a city that was mapped um, uh, as a gridded city, but of course inhabited and lived in um, uh, for um, uh, you know uh, generations and multitudes before. Um, of course, um, the city's founding is kind of cloaked in a in a story, um, in a history um, of the British um, Quakers, including William Penn um, and the Lenny Lenape people, um, in an agreement, in a treaty of of peace and friendship that was meant to last as long as the creeks and rivers flow and the sun, moon, and stars shine. Um, just a generation after that agreement, um, William Penn's sons um, and um, colleague James Logan um, perpetuated a massive land theft um, of Lenape land um, that, that resulted in the broader development um, of southeastern Pennsylvania and the dispossession of Native American lands. And this is not a hidden history. This has been heard in Pennsylvania Supreme Court. There are historic markers and monuments um, marking this history, but it's not as well known as the founding of our city, in part because the founder William Penn statue is on top of our city hall. I'll show you images in a bit. And of course, in Philadelphia, you can see here an image in the background of, of Independence Hall, um, where the Declaration of Independence um, was signed. And Philadelphia is a, a you know a birthplace of American democracy. Um, but the very architects of that democracy, as we all know, were also enslavers and struggling with the question of slavery in the in the young nation and nonetheless practicing it um, and exploitively nonetheless. And so what you also have here in this picture um, is uh, the pavilion where the new Liberty, where the Liberty Bell um, was newly installed um, over a decade ago. And in the course of excavations for that site, um, what we found in Philadelphia were the foundations, um, uh, archeological foundations of the first presidential residence which um, of course also meant the first presidential slave quarters. And when Philadelphia was the capital of the country and President Washington um, was here, um, Philadelphia you know, was a, a, a Northern city, but it was right on the Mason-Dixon line and slavery was practiced right here. Um, and, but the laws are slightly different so that in Pennsylvania at that time, if you were an enslaved person and you were brought to Philadelphia and you were here for more than six months, you would gain your freedom. And so George Washington and Martha Washington would keep time and look for the moments where um, uh, their in, uh, people that they enslaved would be cycled out of Philadelphia after um, right before six months. Um, and of course, there's um, incredible stories, including the historian Erica Armstrong Dunbar's biography of Ona Judge, never caught a woman who escaped Philadelphia's network of the Underground Railroad. Um, and so I, I want to just call this to attention um, in part to acknowledge that, you know, I'm reaching you from Philadelphia, which is a, a place of stolen lands built by stolen hands. Just also to point out something about the story of this structure, which is known as the President's House. President's House is right there on Independence Mall. It is, again, right by the Liberty Bell, right by the Independence Hall. Um, and it could have easily been wiped from public memory. In fact, as the excavations of the site were going on to prepare for the movement of the Liberty Bell, the initial thought from the National Park Service was, no, 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 we, we can't tell this story here of, of slavery. It's too close 
to these great symbols of freedom. And it was the work of activists, of historians, of community members, um, especially from communities of color in Philadelphia that said, wait a second, we actually have to tell the story of slavery and freedom, of justice, of democracy, and of injustice and oppression together. It's all of our story. And that is why we have the president's house today. And in a country, you know, with a national mall that has no um, monument or memorial to the millions of, of people who were enslaved or killed during the years um, of, of enslavement in this country, this as a national site is arguably one of a handful on federal property that acknowledges that fuller story of slavery and freedom together. Monument Lab began as a classroom project. I had been finishing um, my PhD, came back to my hometown of Philadelphia um, to teach a class called Memory Monuments in Urban Space. My colleague, Ken Lum, who I had met soon after, was also um, new to Philadelphia, uh, but he had come and we were asking many questions that were related that we realized. It had to do with in a city that had hundreds of monuments and built itself as a capital of public art and culture. Um, why was it that when you looked around the statues of the city, they didn't actually represent the diversity of the city and our fuller history? So in a city that was majority African-American, um, at that time, there were no statues to full figure African-American uh, African Americans on public land. And, and of course, there were a few um, on private land, but publicly visible. Um, but, you know, there were three likenesses of Ben Franklin alone on the north side of City Hall. But we also looked out across the city and realized that if you looked off the pedestal and you counted murals, if you counted historic markers, if you counted historic societies, even commemorations, you'd actually get a fuller story of, of the city. And that included stories of the Underground Railroad, of abolition, of, of the rise of women's rights, of suffrage, of LGBT rights and onward. And realize that, you know, a, a broader recognition about history. We know that history doesn't happen because some dude rolls into town on a horse and looks off into the distance. It happens also not with individuals, it's groups of people, it's collectives, it's struggle that's fought across time. And so, we kind of started at that point with our students and trying to ask, well, what would it look like to see a fuller history represented? And what do we do with the monuments that we've inherited? That began a series of events and I'll talk through more of it today, but um, you know, it really then utilizing the, the tools of contemporary art, of coalition building, of, of, of listening. We began the work of Monument Lab um, first in an installation in the courtyard of City Hall in 2015 a citywide exhibition in Philadelphia in 2017, um, and then projects and partnerships around the country. Um, Monument Lab now is a collective of people, um, mostly in Philadelphia, but others in New Orleans and New York um, and elsewhere around the country. And we're a public art and history studio. And you know our goal is to cultivate the conversations that are necessary to really critically engage those monuments we've inherited and unearth the next generation of monuments. And there are circles of people that are part of Monument Lab. So while I'm here with you today, there's of course other members of our team. There are Monument Lab fellows um, across um, two cohorts, um, including a group, Take Action Chapel Hill, um, who are behind organizing to remove the Silent Sam um, statue on campus and other important anti-racist gestures and, and organizing. Um, there are other folks in Richmond, in California, in Toronto. Um, and just to, to highlight the fact that, you know, when we're talking about monuments, it's not just about 2020. It's about the work for generations, and especially over the last decade, that have precipitated this moment. I would say for Monument Lab, which began in 2012, as I said, in a classroom, when we started, we felt like we were late to the conversation because we already had noticed at that time and over the years that we were growing into a kind of public facing um, project that already outside um, in the streets, in public squares, um, in conversations about education, that we were seeing a growing movement 
of artists, of organizers, of educators saying that, look, this monument in my city, it doesn't represent my full history or it hasn't really told the truth or it's languished there silently for decades. And I want to have more conversation, more thinking, update and evolve. Um, you know, for me, I'll just say before I dive into more of the presentation, you know, I study history, I work with artists, um, and I'm invested in um, projects that are about social change and really thinking about history, not as something that's behind glass um, or frozen in time, but history is something that we pass to one another, that we um, learn about sometimes in public, but also um, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in intergenerational ways. Um, and, you know, I think it's important for us to remember that, you know, a lot of times statues are doing a lot of work. We kind of say in a shorthand way that they hold history or they equal history. And I want to remind us that people hold history. And it's our responsibility to think about history, not um, in a way that it's frozen or above us or beyond reproach, but history is something that changes and evolves. And monuments are a part of that. Monuments are a way for us to understand our past, but also they're meant to change. For the rest of my talk today, I'm gonna update you with a little bit on Monument Lab projects and our methods. I'll also take moments to kind of move in and out of different cities virtually. And again, we'll have time at the end for, for, for questions and dialogue. Um, so one thing I, I want to note, you know, Monument Lab really began as a passion project. And um, thanks to recent support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, um, we were inaugural grantees of, of a new major initiative, the Monuments Project, a quarter billion dollar um, investment across the country. And we're so grateful for that support. Of course, we're excited because we have colleagues around the country um, who will continue um, to do their work or others who will be able to be supported, including some recent announcements um, like the folks at the Emmett Till Memorial Foundation um, or Prospect New Orleans. Um, but one of the big projects that we're doing with Mellon is a national monument audit. Um, we are doing the equivalent of um, dragging a net across the country, um, but um, really gathering data sets, information that exists on federal, state, local, even civic monuments and trying to understand like what information is out there, what is known about monuments and what kind of connections can we draw when we do something that we try to do at Monument Lab, which is value local knowledge and expertise, but build strategy, build tactics, build learning across different locations and regions. Um, I'm gonna give you a spoiler alert on this audit, which is coming out um, early in this summer. There is not some like magical drawer somewhere or um, file location where you can get a list of all of America's monuments. In fact, I kind of think of it like if you ever have a drawer where you put all your wires and you need to pull one out and then you pull out a big knotted mess and you have to untangle it, that's really the story of America's monuments behind the scenes. Because in fact, while monuments occupy such an important and pivotal part in our everyday conversation and our political realities, um, they're actually really accumulated across time in an ad hoc way. And so one thing that, that I would say is that we're trying to pick that apart and that'll be a long process. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll gain insights and in what we'll learn from the audit will be put into other initiatives that Monument Lab and other people will be a part of. And just because it's always fun to give a little bit of a glimpse, this is in process, this is not accounting for everything. So I just want to offer a caveat, but I, I would be remiss to not kind of give some insight. So we've been gathering data. This is really reflective of a lot of historic markers that have been pulled into our data, because when you pull that net across the country, you're also learning about other things that are not conventional statues, but they are considered or cared for along the monument landscape. And just to give a glimpse um, here, um, again, this is incomplete, but just to note that not only is George Washington um, you know, represented across the monument landscape. A lot of the, the markers here, because there's a big database of historic markers, it's the mentions are actually about every place George Washington set foot, slept, had a meal. But again, if we're looking here as even a brief in process look, there are things that might jump out to you. There's one woman here only, Queen Anne, which is 
um, as we understand it, actually much more attributed to Queen Anne Victorian architecture because um, in, in particular places around the country, municipalities and state agencies identify architecture. It's not because there are hundreds of Queen Anne statues. Um, there's one figure here um, who is African-American or, or person of color, Dr. King. Um, but otherwise what you're seeing is actually a small sliver of the lived history of the United States. And of course, within here, there is so much to unpack, especially the presence um, on a high level of people from the Confederacy who sought to undermine and destroy the country as well. And this is not anything new to share with this group, but that's the thing we really have to reckon with. You know, it's haunting us as a country to think of lost cause memorials and monuments and mindsets that are continuing to actually undermine um, our democracy. So I just wanna pull this out. More will be coming soon um, over the next few months, but just as again, as an in-process view. Um, speaking of in-process, um, you know, across the country, there is a reckoning and reimagining going on. And of course, um, it was spiked in the re-eruption of, of um, uprisings and civil unrest following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless other um, uh, Black Americans who were murdered um, by the state. Um, but of course, this moment um, of uprising not only turned to monuments, um, but it built upon several years of momentum to cha challenge and to um, push forward um, new thinking around a monument landscape. And of course here, um, uh, aerial shot from Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia, you get a sense um, of above um, the site of the Robert E. Lee statue and as um, on the left and as um, uh, organizers and activists on the ground in Richmond have, have renamed um, Marcus David Peters Circle, um, which is in honor of a slain black educator um, killed by police several years ago. And, you know, I've, I've been there um, several times, social distance and masked over the summer, um, but I, I'm not alone in seeing how remarkable this turn is. And it's iconoclastic, it's a challenge, but it's powerful. I have never set foot in another historic space, a monument, a national park that was as alive as this one. Because when you go to this site, first of all, um, right now there are fences around it. Um, the ACLU of, of Virginia has sued the state to, to remove that, um, to allow the very people who have been transforming this site um, back to have access to it. But what I find so remarkable, you know, I wrote a book about the Berlin Wall and it, it conjures that for me, a piece of reviled civic infrastructure that was meant to divide people. Um, in this case here to punctuate a uh, whites only real estate development along Monument Avenue um, with figures um, from the Confederacy. Um, but then the reversal is that it becomes a site to reclaim the narrative. In the case of the Berlin Wall, people dancing on the wall, transgressing it, it eventually becoming a monument to its own demise. And here in Richmond, the kind of release of no longer having to tell the lie that we live in a society that has fully realized its potential for democracy and justice for all. You get to be here and recognize that we are changing. We're evolving. That is what history is. Um, and just seeing how remarkable that was, think, looking at intergenerational people, um, especially Black visitors who are coming and um, taking portraits, um, visiting, learning, talking about the site that had largely been untouched, unlooked at, um, or, or, or I should say untouched and um, looked at only really from afar for, for so long or for the occasional use. And so I think it's a lesson for us um, to think about. This was not a city program. This was not a plan. This was driven by people-powered commemoration. Um, and across the world, People look at this site, the New York Times called it the most remarkable piece of protest art since World War II, as it exists now. Um, and they meant before the fences went up. And so I think it's a lesson for us. I also think it's a lesson um, to really think about the way that 
you can't tell the story of Monument Avenue anymore without the story of these activations, of the occupations, of the way that local activists have pulled here. And I thought this was just a remarkable um, kind of tombstone, the idea that business as usual from 1492 to 2020, that we actually do now have an opportunity that at the greatest sites of, of trauma, we can also have profound transformation. So which brings me here and, you know, thank you to, to Katie and Ed who, you know, we did a kind of virtual visit. Um, if I was here with you this morning, we would have walked outside, um, you know, in the in the moments before this talk and, and gathered. But, um, you know, I, I'm interested to learn in the Q&A a little bit more about your thoughts about the Vance Monument. Um, my understanding is that the inclement weather has blown off the shroud put up over the summer. Um, but I, I, I want to just talk about this in some ways because there's so much to learn. There's been so much research and dialogue um, in the state, and there's great records that that show us stories of its cornerstone being laid in 1897, dedicated in 1898, um, and of course the other additions that have come in over time, like the addition of a 1938 plaque from the Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, but of course, also the maintenance money that has gone into keeping this structure up, um, including $150,000 several years ago. And of course, we need to kind of dig in. And I'm, I'm not, um, I, I want to hear more from you folks, but just even in my, um, you know, kind of digging from afar, the stories that situate off this monument are really important for us to note as well. The legacies of slavery in North Carolina and the fact that people, um, um, you know, were, were, were harmed or were um, part of, of, of um, the slave trade nearby this site are also part of this. Um, and so I just want to point out a few things that kind of caught my eye um, and again, open to, to hearing more. One of them is the story of the time capsule. And I have to say it's not strict to the Vance Monument. In fact, as several Confederate lost cause memorials and monuments have been removed from public spaces across the country over the last few years, there are time capsules beneath. I always think this is fascinating because, you know, the story we get is that monuments are permanent, they're eternal. Of course, we know that monuments are not. Um, they require maintenance money and mindsets to keep them up. But even the very architects of these sites, the people who raised money and lobbied political power and were trying to connect them to other kind of initiatives of holding on um, to, to, to white racial rule, the idea that the time capsule was put in there. It's just a, it's a foil. It's a reminder that they were also putting a human touch on these, that the monuments are not eternal and untouchable, that they were part of trying to push forward subjugation across time. But it's really recognizable. The time capsule is a part of something that, you know, appeals to kind of the ways that we've collected history. I'm also curious about other activations. Um, there's some that we know about more recently, like over last summer and this um, remarkable sign that um, I, I saw in a few different ways uh, documented online or places like AVL Today. Um, but the unspoken parts, the unwritten, the uninscribed, but the nonetheless known very well. What are the stories that happen on and off the pedestal that help us think about the fuller history? And, and not only are pathways to very difficult conversations, but necessary ones, part of healing, part of the work of repair, part of the work of actually, if you say you're a history buff, you gotta get the full history. And this is harder to archive, signs, protests. But, you know, I think for those of us in the public art, public history and civic art realm, we have to figure out how to not just let that story of monuments holding all the history um, be the only way that we value it. Of course, today is February 18th. It's the birthday of, of several in, incredibly important towering black feminist figures like Audre Lorde and um, Toni Morrison. And I just wanna share this quote um, in part because it's helped guide Monument Lab's work and my own research for many years, but it, it, it conjured, as soon as I saw that protest sign, it conjured for me again. Um, and of course, this quote is from Toni Morrison, who is in the process of sharing the novel Beloved, um, which is a story about American history and the haunts and the violence of, of slavery um, and, the, and the wounds and, and, and ghosts that exist. 
And at that time, Toni Morrison, you know, was giving um, a, a talk that's turned into um, a, um, a, an essay um, or pr a printed version of it. And, and she says that there is no place you or I can go to think about or not think about, to summon the presences of or recollect the absence of enslaved people. There's no suitable memorial or plaque or wreath or wall or park or skyscraper lobby. There's no 300 foot tower. There's no small bench by the road. There's not even a tree scored. An initial that I can visit or you can visit in Charleston, Savannah, New York, Providence, or better still on the banks of the Mississippi. And because such a place does not exist, the book had to. I always think about this. I mean, of, of course, um, there are some places that exist. Um, as I noted, there is no national memorial, let alone um, a, a full on system of repair um, or reparation that will go along with it. But of course there are places of memory. And in fact, the Toni Morrison Society um, has dedicated benches by the road, including one here um, um, actually in South Carolina, um, dedicated at places of um, racial trauma and transformation around the country. Do you think about that, that there is not one kind of monument. There is not one kind of memorial. There's actually so many ways that we communicate and share history. And this one, you know, again, in honor of, of today as a, as a day to celebrate um, and appreciate um, the gifts um, that, that the late Tony Morrison left us is to think about that provocation. Also, you know, to think about um, while this picture is in South Carolina, the uh, members of the legislature in South Carolina just introduced a fairly um, restrictive and repressive bill about what history can and cannot be taught. Um, as is being debated, if you look at the, the, the story, um, the, the history that's represented in this um, bill, what you'll find is that slavery as a concept is not introduced till its abolition. It's naturalized as part of the early part of the, the country without dialogue. And these moments when we're talking about the past, we're talking about history, how do we tell the fuller stories? And there's so many others that I'm, I'm not gesturing to here. I would say also just to be really clear, you know, Monument Multiracial Collective, but for me, I'm a, a white Jewish queer person um, who's been working in social justice and anti-racist work and um, in, in gender justice work for many years. Um, but this is a reminder for me to think about what kind of knowledge not only I've come up with, but also what I share and how do I rethink my own inherited stories about the monument landscape. So I'll move forward and, and share a little bit more about Monument Lab. And I'd say, you know, what I'll show, show you is some examples of projects in the wake of these broader, broader um, struggles and also breakthroughs happening across the country. For Monument Lab, we define a monument as a statement of power and presence in public. Um, and that comes out of thousands of conversations with people in public spaces um, over the last several years. And that of course includes the bronze and marble or stone monuments that we see across the country, including the Vance um, Monument um, and others. But it also is meant to include the other ways that people occupy and animate public space through art, through projection, through poetry, through protest. And it all is around this idea that Look, if you have the time, the money, and the official power, you'll build a monument that's important to you. If you don't have the time, the money, or the official power, you gather next to a monument that exists, or you build your own monument, and that is how you make your presence and power felt. <clears throat> Pardon me. And, and so this is the kind of mindset that we've brought into our work across the country. And we are you know, a bridge between um, different constituencies that are part of this ongoing um, conversation. That includes municipal agencies, that includes state governments, that includes museums, but also, and, and, and probably more primarily with grassroots figures like artists, educators, um, organizers. And Monument Lab for us, just to be very clear, is a socially engaged art project, our art form, our, our medium is a civic agency. And that's put us in some fascinating and, and, and really meaningful places to listen, to learn, um, and try to find ways through. Across our projects, we kind of employ five-step approach 
um, that helps guide the way we work. And the first one is question. We always build questions into our projects and we want to dig into a statue, a site or a public space. The next one though is incredibly important. The next step is to connect. We don't believe that a, even if we're invited by a city to help um, you know, on a project or we hear even from, from folks on the ground, we often just assume that this is not the first time the site has ever been questioned or you know, people have tried to think about it. So the first steps are really to organize and exchange ideas with stakeholders invested in places of memory. Investment might mean financial investment or responsibility but sometimes it's the grandmothers on your block that know the neighborhood better than anybody else. Or it's the group of students who've been working with their teachers to tell a story in a new way in public. We then try to unfix, unpause, not assume that the history we've inherited um, is necessarily the only part of the story. And we wanna then redefine that conversation about the past, present and future of monuments. For those folks who might say like, well, you know, we shouldn't touch monuments, that's like, erasing our history. I'm going to ask you, when you want to know about the history of something, do you Google it? Do you go to your library? Do you look for books? Do you go to Netflix? Do you go to YouTube? Or do you go to a monument to read the plaque? So we know that it's possible to redefine the conversation um, based on the way we actually treat history. Then we like to prototype and we work with contemporary artists and um, and uh, do participatory research. And I'll give some shout outs in a moment to some folks in the room here with us. And then finally, we like to report, share our findings, reflections and new directions. It sometimes results in the planning for a future monument or the takedown of one, but a lot of times it's much more about the ecosystem because monuments are tips of the iceberg. You could remove one, but what does that tell you about the systems underneath it or that have supported it for over time? So we're as interested ecosystem and the, and the systems. You can get um, most of our publications for free online on our website. Um, and um, we do have a book that, that you can get from bookshop.org and, and other sources online. But a lot of the reporting we like to do, um, we like to do outside. We like to theorize public space while in public space. Um, we're adjusting um, in the pandemic, but monuments are outside. And so you can more safely still talk about them and we can connect like we are are today in new ways. So among the ways that we've worked, I mentioned the prototype monuments. I wanna share a few here. Um, Karen Olivier's The Battle is Joined is a project that really epitomizes the kind of way that we like to work with artists. Um, Karen um, covered a Revolutionary War monument in a mirror. We talk about how monuments reflect us today. Well, she wanted to make that literal. And then here in a site in the Germantown neighborhood of Philadelphia, which um, the long street behind it was um, originally a, a Lenape walking path. It was converted into a colonial road. Um, and not far from here was the site of the first protest against slavery in what would become the United States. Um, but this is a neighborhood well known for its colonial history. George Washington's summer house is down the street. Um, it is now predominantly black and working class. And so Karen wanted to create a monument um, as a temporary activation that would cover not the most controversial or contentious monument, but just a one that kind of floats in the background. And it went up and, you know, we had all these plans like what would happen if it gets scuffed up or vandalized. It was never vandalized. In fact, um, members of the community cleaned it um, as a self-appointed gesture once a week. Um, there were prayer circles, there were selfies, there were all kinds of pilgrimages here. And, and also quite powerfully, depending on the angle you went at, Sometimes it would actually disappear from sight. And while it was a temporary activation, it actually has stayed in the afterlife. There have been books about this neighborhood, there are community events that still use this symbol um, and circulate it because it's part of the story of the place. Um, Tanya Bergera, Cuban artist, um, who um, proposed to work with us somewhere on something that in some ways felt very conventional. It was an elevated single figure monument outside of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. And um, but Tanya wanted to make a monument to new immigrants, especially as she said, immigrant groups that um, were not honored um, uh, in legacy uh, kind of structures around the city, but also who were giving so much. Um, and of course, in 2017, under the framework of, of incredibly harsh and repressive um, tactics against, against immigrant groups. 
what separated Tanya's monument is that she didn't want it to be made um, whole. She wanted it um, and firm. She wanted it to be made of unfired clay so that it would fall apart over time, reveal its armature based on the weather, um, and that there would be several additional versions ready to replace it. And that's Tanya's way of marking presence and absence, and also the idea of, of loss, that so much is given to be here. Um, I also just want to note, as I said, monuments, you know, are not permanent. They require maintenance money and, and mindsets from keeping them from crumbling. And in fact, many of the monuments that we have inherited, um, they might look like this over time if they aren't steadily invested in. Um, and so it's just a reminder monument is permanent, um, but they all exist in time scales that we want to think about and want to think about how we renew them or bring them forward or even transition them. Um, and then, of course, a big shout out um, to North Carolina's own Mel Chin. Um, and of course, hi, Amanda Wiles, who is key part of this work um, with uh, Mel Chin Studio um, and I think is here with us today. Mel wanted to create a monument that had the idea that anyone could rise to monumental status, seven feet tall. Um, the key is that someone else could right across from you. And that balanced the me and the we. And in the case of his kind of honor to Philadelphia, the founding documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the guaranteeing of um, personal um, rights, or at least the promise of, and of course, the Declaration of We the People. So important to Mel's work was 90 feet of ADA accessible ramp snaking behind each of these. People went up in strollers and um, bikes and walkers. And I think, you know, it's a reminder of the hidden infrastructure of power that's necessary to be able to rise to monumental status. Um, just a few other projects before, before I go to wrap up. Um, in, in Newark, New Jersey, we worked with New Arts Justice and Salamisha Tillett um, and the teams there in Military Park um, to reinterpret and reimagine that space. And with the brilliant artist, Jam uh, photographer Jamel Shabazz, who is a veteran, in a park that's dedicated to um, military history as the second oldest park in the United States um, behind Boston Common, um, he wanted to honor Black veterans who were not a part of the official landscape um, and to have it juxtaposed with a statue behind it by Gutson Borglum called Wars of America. And Borglum is well known for um, Mount Rushmore um, and Confederate Stone Mountain. And so his biography and kind of American um, sculpture and monuments is one of Americana and white supremacy braided together. Um, Jamel's, statue, Jamel's um, prototype monument here was a way to counterpoint with portraits on either side. Um, and closer up, another artist who grew up in, in Newark, Manuel Acevedo, had long looked at the statue of Wars of America over time and wanted permission to experiment with it. You know, I know we talked about the, the shroud. I think of this as like an artist-led way of saying, we want to rethink this monument. And he said it was powerful for him to be up on this, on this pedestal for six hours. Um, a pedestal, by the way, that includes granite from the Stone Mountain Quarry um, in Georgia. And just the ability to touch, to contact, to study the monument was for him something radical. Of course, also a part of Monument Lab's work is that theorizing in public space. So we like to hire people who are already doing the work, artists, educators, young people, students, um, give credit to college students and, and internship opportunities and have them ask questions that don't have one answer, but actually have a multitude of possibilities. And we try to do that in a number of ways. We're data people, but we also like to have um, paper forms because you can break a paper form. You can. We've done this kind of work um, around the country and, um, and, and in Canada as well. And what we learn is that when you ask people questions and you do it in a way that's open enough, but has some parameter here, the shape of a piece of paper, where you ask them a question that is not just about the practical, but it's about what's possible. What are the values? What are the visions of a city? You get the most remarkable answers. Some of them are haunting. Some of them are, are tragic, um, but they're also pack in them a sense of hope a sense of imagination 
that we don't have to actually keep doing the same thing we've always been doing, but we can imagine other ways to memorialize and bring forward our ideas. Um, we've done this, like I said, in public spaces here at the underneath the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, um, and a shout out to, to um, Tyler Green here from Modern Arts, uh, uh, Modern Art Notes podcast, who we spoke about this project, um, which was asking people in a city well known for iconic monuments, how they would map the monuments of St. Louis. And you find out new things. You find out that, yes, the arch was the most cited um, in our study with 750 people in public, but fewer than half of the people we asked included the arch. They included other places like Ferguson or the Dred Scott um, Courthouse um, or other sites that included those that had been raised and others that were yet to be built. And finally, you know, over the last year, we've been um, thinking about other ways to reach people because we are not doing face-to-face -face engagement. So we released a free Monument Lab field trip, which looks like it's made for a cool seventh grader. But we've heard from retirees, from grad programs, also from elementary schools that they've used it in their own communities as a way to um, both socially distance, you can ask, actually do it all from home. But if you go outside, you can use the monuments as a kind of living textbook and your own writing to reimagine. Another quick preview, um, we're revealing our next augmented reality project um, in just a couple of weeks featuring the artist Ursula Rucker, a beloved poet from Philadelphia. And we've gathered up as much as we can um, about a particular site in Philadelphia, the steps leading up to the iconic art museum. And we'll be releasing this in March, the first day of spring. Um, and it's a kind of touring app that also allows for feedback and gathering new information and new ideas. And we're hopefully expand this across other places as well. I'm gonna close with four closing mantras before we go to our Q&A. And one is just a reminder that there's no such thing as permanence in public art. I would add to that, you know, we talk about permanent collections and museums and temporary loans. There is a timeline between temporary and permanent. Our permits don't often have them in public spaces and our mindsets can be updated. We can, if you, it, we can do work that's generationally impactful, that is um, important to pass on to future generations. But if we remove the word permanence, not just from our art vocabulary, but from our environmental category, from our, from our democracy categories, what, was, what would it force us to do? It forced us to think about new ways to both look forward and share, let go, build coalition. A reminder that there are no neutral public spaces. A big shout out to Latanya S. Autry and Mike Murawski of the museums are not neutral hashtag that's been used over a million times online. Um, sometimes we say like, okay, let's just put the st statue in a different public space, like a museum or a library or a cemetery. Those are not neutral either. So if we didn't look for neutral, but we looked for um, other kinds of important stewardship relationship it might yield new possibilities. I've talked to folks who say, oh my gosh, well, we're gonna remove this statue. We know that it, it reflects um, you know, uh, harmful things, it's doing bad work, but we're gonna have to pay all this money to store it um, or remove it. And I say like, well, let's just, or, or even maintain it. What if we thought differently about neutrality and instead tried to understand power dynamics that have imprinted themselves across our public spaces? For those folks out there who do this work, I wanna say you have many tools, including your budgets, your maintenance, your inventories, your conservation. Note that I didn't put up new signs here because new signs like seems like the, the easy way. It's, it's like, you know, um, painting around um, problems. But I do think, and I hear from municipal art officers all the time, how they're rethinking the work that they do. They're thinking about how they can divert maintenance funds to new things. They're thinking about, even in this time of deep shared sacrifice, how they can partner with different civic agencies to create new opportunities. So I wanna just highlight whoever you are, wherever, wherever you're working, no matter if you can do big work or small work, there's something here in this moment for you. Um, and then finally, to balance presence and absence, loss and resilience. You know, We're at a moment where we're facing catastrophic loss we're approaching a half a million Americans killed in a pandemic, and we know it did not have to be this way. When we talk to artists about what monuments they wanna see, or even community members across the country, 
they don't always say like, okay, I want just this new monument. Let's replace this one with this one. They actually want to talk about presence and absence. They want to talk about who's been missing and how the processes have led to the monuments we have. They want places to measure loss. And that will happen with or without state sponsors because people build altars and they build sites of memory. They don't wait for a city to tell them to do so because we have that as an impulse. And we're seeing that across, across now the pandemic. They also, I think we wanna have moments for hope, for resilience, for speaking truth to power, for not keeping lies up in public space, but actually to find new ways. So that again, we can think about at the greatest sites of trauma and challenge. It demands much of us. There's something for all of us, big or small, but it can also be our next steps for transformation. Thank you. That was wonderful, Paul. So many great things to think about. Um, I'm the chair of the City of Asheville's Hill Garden Cultural Commission. And the, I love what you said um, around, you know, the maintenance of public art is very expensive. Um, and so just think about how we renew monuments. Um, I'm really interested to explore that further. Um, so I would like to welcome our moderators to the stage now. Um, today's moderators are uh, Darren Waters, who's the special assistant to the chancellor at UNC Asheville and executive producer of the Waters and Harvey show on BPR. And Aisha Adams, who is the founder and executive director of the Asheville View. Nora Ryan, Equity and Diversity Institute Program Developer. Darren and Aisha, I'll let you take it from. Thank you, Katie. And uh, Aisha, once again, has um, instructed me to go first. And, and I will just go ahead and follow suit. Uh, <clears throat> good to see you there, Aisha. Paul, thank, thank you so much. I mean, it's very thought provoking. Um, as you were presenting, I was collecting books from my shelves that relate to many of the issues that you were raising. Um, one thing I want to say here too uh, is, is that I'd love to just get to the questions that folks have been asking, but I'd like to ask you this, that make first make this observation that, you know, as a professional historian, and I know you as a professional scholar as well, that you have to be aware that we, we are not always aware of the impact that these monuments have on us. And you address that in your, your presentation. And I'm wondering what can we do to get a more broader general public to realize that? And it seems that it would force us to think differently about what monuments we decide to create as we are to build as we go forward. Um, and here, I think, Paul, very deeply about, and, and I was trying not to do this, but I'm going to do it, but I will preference what I'm going to say here, who I'm going to reference by saying that if anyone saw a recent interview that uh, Representative uh, Congressman uh, James Clyburn gave on TV, you would have heard him quote Alexis de Tocqueville. So I, I'm not the only one who is quoting Tocqueville. And one thing that Tocqueville said in Democracy in America is that Americans are really not given to thinking about the past that much. We think about the present. We are economically driven people. Yesterday in the conversation that Marcus and I had with Mitch Landrew, Mitch was saying that again. And he said one way that he got people to really engage this conversation in New Orleans was to say, OK, think about the economic impact that this could have on a city if we don't address the monuments issue. So I'm wondering, what can we do to get people to think about this in a much more a broader way, philosophical? In many ways, the people who are here in this room right now, I would say, you know, this is, we're the believers, we're the converted, you know? So how do we bring our unconverted, some of our unconverted fellow citizens along in this conversation? Yeah. Well, well, thank you for that incredibly thoughtful question. I'm just such a, a treat and an honor to be here with both of you um, for, for <clears throat> You know, I, I, I think actually, you know, the story is that Americans just look forward. But I, I think not only are we obsessed with the past, we're haunted by the past. And um, that's what happens when, you know, you never had a, a full reckoning, a full accounting of, of what has happened in history. And you can see, you know, the, the very kind of shivers down the spine of those who want to protect 
a single narrative. So I think, you know, one thing I just want to um, say, like when we look at um, this, these stories of like tourism, of course, is a great um, uh, economic rationale. I, I want to go to a kind of different one, which is around history, which is that um, we are at a moment um, in our own development that as a society where the tools to be able to experience the past, to learn about the past, to hear stories is unprecedented. We have um, not only access across, you know, digital sources, but like there are app developers that um, are working to help reconstruct the ruins of places long lost. There are archivists around the country who are digitizing and scanning the files that have been hiding in the back of the back of the storage space. So announcement this week about oral histories from indigenous communities that are being digitized and made accessible. There are no longer the same gatekeepers to the historical enterprise. Um, I, I think also about in the city of New Orleans, um, you know, you mentioned Mayor Landrieu, before it became a civic issue, before he got on board, there were already activists on the ground who were doing public, learn, pu public teaching, public learning. You know, a big shout out to Paper Monuments um, and New Orleans and, uh, and um, the Take Them Down folks and many coalitions who were doing that work outside of civic structures. So we have all of these ways. Monuments are part of it, but monuments are just such a small sliver. And so something that I would say is to tie up, even for the folks in this room who may be the converted, so to speak, is to actually say, like, we, we have tools, we have opportunities to do this work in new ways that we haven't before, but we also have a new critical lens on not just, not just expecting the same old. We know that if we don't unpack who does the storytelling, how it's accounted for, um, how it sits with and alongside the initiatives for justice, it, it actually won't do enough. So that's where the responsibility for us comes in as well. And I think that's why I say there's something big or sm and small that everyone can do every day. Um, if we don't, we will be putting our heads in the sand. And we know that we're gonna keep repeating harm. We're gonna keep repeating um, not living up to our fullest potential as a society. And that um, while it seems like it's easier to turn away it's not in the long run. We have to really think about the legacy that we're shaping and we can do that in participatory ways. I always say Monument Lab is like, we invite people in, but it has to be recognizing that, that this momentum has been growing for, for a long time for folks on the ground. Right? And how do we lift those folks up as well to rethink and, and, and pivot forward? I'm so excited to ask my question. What's interesting to me is this new use of uh, technology and the way that you're reframing how monuments are created. And I'm super excited about the Ursula Rucker project because I'm a big fan of the roots. Um, so that's really exciting to me. And I guess my question to you is simply, are statues um, no longer an art form that we should be looking at for public art when we look at the fact that they cost money and they cost maintenance and they cost mindset. Whereas like the project you're doing with Ursula Rucker is a time sensitive project. It's digital, it can be archived. It does not necessarily need maintenance and upkeep. Is that like what we're moving to more sustainable art as we move this way? Um, or are statues super valuable and do we need to sell them to the people who love them um, and put them in budgets for reparation? Like, where do you stay at? Okay. Aisha, you just laid out such, such thoughtful and, and full and like, we could do a whole, we could do a whole wor workshop series on all the things you said. So I just want to pick up on a, a few really important, well, definitely important things that, that hit me. One of them is, um, you know, I actually don't think there's a one size fits all model because, you know, look, like there are some places, I'm just channeling a few different voices here. Like I'm thinking about places um, around the country who said, look, we have, you know, when you're thinking about um, in, a, in a given community, like we've never had a monument to um, a black person elevated on high in, in the city square, or, um, you know, like we're in an Asian American community, we wanna be represented. And so I, I don't want to like undermine the impulse to feel that 
there is something powerful about that, right? Um, and also being able to be a part of that process to not just wait for someone to do it for you, but actually to do it for, you know, to, to have that kind of um, self-determination be honored. But also know that other side you bring up that, um, you know, I think about the words of Mining Lab fellow Free Bangura, who's also the chair of the History and Culture Com um, Commission in Richmond. And she's called those kind of statues, the Gilded Age, Gilded Age trophies. And um, that haunts me too, right? I know of places where um, cities have deaccessioned art that has helped fund um, other things, but sometimes they end up in the places um, and in the hands of people who want to re-elevate those racist figures as well. So I think um, in technology, look, like I'm a big proponent of technology, but I'm also a big, um, you know, like cautionary person, because let me tell you, technology breaks too. Technology sounds so good, but if you don't connect it to the real environment and people and have relationships with it, it's just a technocratic solution. So like the app that we're doing the overtime, like it had to involve a poet. It had to involve researchers. Um, we didn't want it to tell um, one story. We want to tell many stories and use it as a launching point. So I think if anything, the thing that I would love to see, the probably two things, and it's really based on great ideas you brought up. One is different timeframes. There is not just per permanent and temporary. There can be monuments that are put up for 20 years. There are um, ways with historic architecture, we do adaptive reuse all the time for buildings that are hundreds of years old. So what would it mean even to introduce that idea in our monument landscape? What are other temporalities? There are artists who are working, the science is there. You can have a monument do a half-life decay over 20 years or 10 years. Um, you can also fund pedestal programs where different artists come in um, every few years and put up something that's meant to last for that duration. Because truly the permanent monuments are actually only made to last for a particular duration. We just end up footing the bill later. Um, and then the last thing you said is so important is the connection to, to, to social justice, to the work of repair. Um, and it's not one or the other. Sometimes you hear um, folks say like, well, let's not focus on the monuments. We gotta focus on the real stuff. And I would just say, actually, we don't have to negotiate against ourselves. We need to think in coalition so that um, it is important to do all of that work and to do it in concert coalition together. Okay, thank you for that response, uh, Paul. And here, here's where I would like to go again. There's a question here that I'm, I'm looking at. It's, by, it's from David um, and I hope, can you hear me, Paul? I can't. Sure. Yeah. My screen is telling me something else. <clears throat> but um, I heard in your response to my question, or earlier question, that whether we realize it or not, there there is a deep philosophical kind of, there's a philosophy that moves us as a people here in this country. Um, again, Tocqueville in his book says, there is a philosophy that moves Americans, but they're not always aware of it. They are glad to pass that off to people like ourselves to kind of toy with that. And so the American capitalist uh, ethos is what drives most of most of us, which is itself a philosophical, um, you know, <laughs> but we don't see it that way and we can hear that now. So David has asked a question here. I can't see it, read his last name, but he is pointing us back to the old world. I would say the old world again. He's saying, if you're familiar with the book, Learning from the Germans, would you comment on what the Germans have done to address the Holocaust and what we can learn from them in addressing our race history? And I, I think it's an important question. We don't always like to turn to other people to learn anything here in this country, but I think it's an important question to kind of to engage. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that question. And I, I will, I'll say a few things. Um, you know, one of them is, uh, you know, I was looking at that, I mentioned that South Carolina le um, legislation that's up for debate, that's that's really worrisome. And in it, you know, we don't, we only see slavery um, after that, like abolition um, begins as if we didn't have struggle before. But you do see the Berlin Wall because the Berlin Wall shows up in all of these different contexts in the United States to celebrate freedom um, and sometimes grapple with repression here. 
So you know, you'll see pieces of the Berlin Wall all around um, presidential libraries and public places around the country. There is actually a piece of the Berlin Wall outside of the National Underground Railroad and Freedom Center um, in Cincinnati, right at the bank of the Ohio River that used to mark the separation of um, enslaved spaces and free spaces. But of course, there's a lot of other places where it's just a trophy of, of, of this idea of freedom. What, in the mention of Susan Neiman's book, Learning from the Germans, I, I would just say, you know, for me, I'm, I, I, w I went to Berlin as a Jewish person. I felt haunted there. But I have to say, I'd see Holocaust memorials um, all around the city in different scale. I, there's some that are big in the city of Berlin as a city block that are right in the heart of the city. And there are others that are small as a cobblestone, the Stolpersteiner Project. And in addition to that, I knew about programs of financial reparation to Jewish families and others who lost their livelihoods, who were deported and killed. Um, and then, you know, also curriculum and education across generations. And I'm not saying the Germans are, are perfect. They have a lot of history um, to heal. But that multi-tiered approach, you know, what it did for me as a Jewish person in Germany, I felt relief. I didn't feel any solace in the pain of my ancestors, but I felt relief in not having to tell the lie, to not seeing it wiped away, wiped clean. It was like seeing scars of a, of a city, of a place. And amidst those scars, amidst those places, there were new opportunities, funding for artists. Um, I think about, you know, again, today is also the birthday of, of, of the late Black feminist lesbian poet, Audre Lorde, who spent a lot of time in Berlin. I found that fascinating when I was there. So this, the, all of that is to say um, there is a lot to learn from Germany, not just that we need one monument to fix, but you need systems. You need to upkeep them. And, and it's not something that's forever. Germany is battling the same kind of forces of disinformation um, and the rise of, of um, white nationalism. Um, but the, the, the last thing I'll just say, um, I found fascinating and it's just a personal journey. When I went to Berlin for the first time as a college student, uh, studying abroad, and it just blew me away. I felt more safe there as a, as a Jewish and queer person than I did anywhere else in Europe. Um, and that was a place that I had grown up being told, don't go there. Like that's haunted, that's harmed, that's too much. But while I was in Berlin, in addition to learning about Jewish history, it, it set off something for me back then, this was in the early 2000s, that I was like, well, what's the, if this city shows the scars on its surface, what are the scars that I don't see in the United States? And I remember having this thought of like, I learned in college about hundreds of uprisings um, across the country that um, were results of police brutality um, against largely black communities. And I had, I was like, I'd never seen a memorial Maybe I've seen like a historic sign. I know I've heard about it. I've talked to people about it, but I never, I never saw that memorial. And I thought I'm having this feeling in Berlin. Like I'm walking through almost like it's viscous. It's like, this is charged. This is an intense place. And I thought, well, if you're in the United States, where can you walk as an indigenous person, as a, as a black person, person of color, it doesn't have that history too. And so that for me, as uh, you know, in, from my own identity standpoint, it was a real wake up call to say, wow, I can learn. This was a site that had was so traumatized, but I'm learning the tools for transformation and healing and their insights to share. Wow, that's really powerful. I want to kind of combine some of these questions that I see in the chat to, um, together to see if we can get more of them answered. So I don't know if you know, but I'm the... Um, program developer for Lenore Ryan's Diversity and Equity Institute. And we're always talking about how change happens in the policies, procedures, and practices. Um, mm. And so that's really important to me. So I'd like to hear from you in terms of our public art um, and our issue, our biggest issue, which is the Vance Monument, which is uh, people want to know, you know, is it worth renaming? Is it worth um, having people put their feelings up or do we change it? And then what policies and procedures do you think um, support the evolution of public art here? Um, what suggestions do you have? No, that, I mean, look, I think there's two rhythms of time to balance 
now. And one of them is um, acting urgently, like there's harm still being done. And the other one is reflective. It's like, what actually is a way to make generational change? And I'm gonna tell you, that's not easy. That's two sides of a coin that are hard to balance. So the first thing I would just say, and like what to do with this monument, and I would I have said this across many different places, I wanna know what the folks, um, especially artists and educators um, and young people and, and activists, like the very people who are impacted by this, I wanna know what they have to say. Um, I wanna hear what they're saying, because they're saying it. If you're as a city official or someone in an institution, you may not be hearing it, you may not be listening or 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 what have you, um, but you might be and, and how to connect some of those. So it's really important to kind of hear those perspectives. It's important to pull out the, the history and the story of that place so we understand it's not just um, eternally there, that it has required these other moments of investment, um, but also what's happened off of the pedestal nearby it and make all of that, I think a part is in many ways a model of a truth and reconciliation process. That says, look, like we want something new, but we need accountability first. And we wanna know how we got to this point. So that's the first thing I wanna hear from folks. And, and then you move to the point of like, look, it's not necessarily designed by committee where you're like, all right, everyone, um, what do we do? I, I'm not really even a fan sometimes of, of competitions um, design competitions. Sometimes they can unearth a lot of ideas, but there may be other ways to do that. But then I think you move toward, all right, what are the ways that we want to now, maybe not try to fix things permanently or forever, but we want to make a dent in the way that um, our city values itself and its history and its future. And so that then is also about coalition. It's about, uh, you know, really valuing local knowledge and expertise. It is also about connecting dots, whether it's outside of the city or beyond in the state, and really thinking about not just a rush to fix a problem and check it off, but rush to repair, rush to big thinking, rush to the fact that you don't actually have to do the same old, same old. You could do something new. It does take some people to, to say, this is what we're doing. This is our intention. But again, you know, in that notion of the truth and the lie, I'd much rather hear the intention of someone and understand where their limits are and what, what they're trying to do than I want someone to try to clean up something um, and do this. In terms of policy, there's a lot of different ways to go, but I want to make sure we get a few more other questions in. But it's, again, is thinking about process. If you want the different outcome, but you have the same process to do it, from before you're gonna have the same outcome. So how do you think about process as much as important as outcome? Thank you for that response as well. I, I'd like to ask, you know, here in North Carolina, I, I'm serving as a member of the, of the North Carolina Historical Commission. And we have been in conversation uh, with uh, about the creation of a new park in the city of Raleigh, which will be named Freedom Park. Um, it was Phil Fre Freeline, Phil Freeline, the, the architect, um, award-winning architect who passed away, uh, I guess, a couple of years ago. Um, it, it was his last project. And looking at the design, it's going to be more of a symbol than it is to any one given person, which is, you know, a different way of doing this. And so, and I know that you addressed that as well in your, uh, in your presentation. And I'm wondering if that's if that is the way we need to be thinking more as we look to the future and monuments that we build, monuments to ideas and the ideas that we said have shaped us. But I do have a question about corporate America because of Michelle, I can't see Michelle's uh, last name here, can't make it out, but Michelle has asked an interesting question. It's quite specific. And she says that in room 335 at the Doubletree Hilton near the, the Biltmore, are two pieces of wall art. Uh, one is of the Vance Monument. And she's asking what responsibilities does corporate America have in this movement? And I think that's an, a very important question. Yeah, both, both of those are, are, are important questions. Um, and also I want to say Dr. Waters, um, as a member of that commission, I want to just respect that you have your work cut out for you. So wishing a lot of, um, a lot of energy um, to you and your colleagues, because that's, you know, that's hard work. And so, if you you know, I always want to, I want, I want uh, municipal art officers and history commissioners 
to be at their best and to push for change, but I also want to give them their due and their respect because they have hard work um, ahead. So um, I'll try to answer both of those. I'll answer the corporate one first and then um, um, the second, uh, the, the first, the first question. So thank you. That Like what a detail. That's just a reminder to me that that notion that history doesn't live in any one statue. It's all around us. And what a great eye. And so even if you take down a monument, you still have like, we're, we're talking about not just mindsets, we're talking about the other representations in a place. Um, you know, I'm thinking even about Monument Avenue in Richmond, the the statue will come down, but the housing um, historic district around it uses the emblem of the Lee statue on the front doors of many of the homes around that area. So it's, it's deeply in the, in the kind of other iconography of a place. Um, I think that what we often see, or at least we're seeing now, is um, on one hand, corporations stepping up and being a part of change. Um, but I want to be very clear. They don't do that on their own benevolence. They are pushed by employees. Um, they are pushed by their publics. They are pushed by their strategic communications firms. And so, again, my question about process and relationship, it is... It's the minimum here, folks. The minimum bar is the take that down and issue your statement. I don't know if anyone's waiting for your statement, and if they are, that's another matter. But could you go beyond the minimum? And you might be able to dig into your own history. You could look at your own company if you if you go back to legacies of exclusion. You could think about new active programs to build new leadership. Um, you could think about the way that you interface with community. So I'm I'm thinking like. I want to appreciate what's happening, like as as a kind of historian of the moment, seeing like, wow, before we'll have federal legislation for 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 some of these important justice issues, there are companies that take it on. I also just want to note, like, where does change come from? It's the fire lit. Um, it's the it's the passion. It is the vision of folks who are doing the work. And um, so I want the bar more than the bar minimum. And I think that's a great opportunity. Now's the time, folks. If you're in a you know, big or small um, corporate environment to think about those relationships and still look out for your livelihood. Like, I think it is a business decision too, in turn, but, but I think it's also deeply about relationships over time. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to stand for? And who do you want to welcome to your circle? Um, I think the question you bring up about Raleigh is a fascinating one. I think, look, there are individuals who really, we should, we, many of us should know about, if not all of us. And I'm, I think it's more than that, the images I showed you here or the typical portrait wall in any university or library. Um, there are people who didn't have the time to sit for a portrait. They were not given that access. They didn't get the monument builders, but they have been remembered and stewarded in their own communities and sustained us in, in far other ways. But at the same time, how do we think about the collective? How do we not make pedestals so tall in our minds that we don't see everyday actions that we can be a part of? Um, how do we know, again, history doesn't happen because someone rolls into town on a horse and looks off into the distance. Um, but instead, we think about all the people not on the pedestal who made that person's work possible, whether it is their family, whether it is their teachers, whether it is the people they may have exploited, whether they were enslavers, Right. We need to see the hidden infrastructure who's suppressed around it. But in addition to that, celebrate collectivity because we know the myth of the individual in this country. Nothing can be done by yourself. So it takes all of us. How do we celebrate standout figures to have people to to look forward to, look back to, um, but also have spaces where the collectivity is there? And, and it might not just be neutral and it might not be just generic. Like this is to everybody. Everyone gets a monument. It's like, no, I want to name this community group. I want to name this group of grandparents. I want to name the group of, of students who did this action. And then I want to signal a place for many more people to gather and join. Thank you so much for that, uh, Aisha. <laughs> um, <laughs> you our time so I, don't, I, think, I, I, I think that time is up, but if it's not up, I'd like to throw in, uh, see, time's up. Sorry, y'all, I was going to try to stop another question. Well, I would just say, if you have more, 
more conversation, um, like let's continue it. You can follow Monument Lab at Monument underscore Lab um, on Twitter, on Instagram. We'd love to hear from you or, or go to our website, join the mailing list. And I hope we all get to keep going um, another time as well. I'm so grateful. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I think so. I hope so. Thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation today. Lots of great insights and what a rich conversation, all of you. Um, really appreciate it. You guys can all log off now. I have a few more announcements for you. So Monument Lab will be back virtually on March 11th um, for an event organized by the Center for Craft in partnership with UNC Asheville on Crafting Resilience, Public Health and Collective Memory. Crafting Resilience is a three-part series exploring how craft can cultivate cultivate strength and sustainability in individuals, spaces, and communities in the face of adverse conditions. The first event will examine how the critical and creative practices of craft and public art can be reimagined to better serve and support the well-being of BIPOC communities. So to learn more, visit centerforcraft.org. March 18th, we will be back here for a third event in our Equity and Creative Placemaking series with Maria R. Jackson. Institute Professor at the Studio for Creativity, Place, and Equitable Communities at Arizona State University's Herberger Institute of Design and the Arts. Maria will talk more about the connection between arts and public health and explore what equitable creative placemaking means. Uh, we hope you will join us. If you're not already registered, you can go to leadershipashville.unca.edu to register. Over to you, Ed. Thanks, Katie. I really appreciate it. And again, my thanks to Darren and Aisha, and especially to Paul for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking time to be with us. Uh, Paul, I'm going to touch base with you right afterward. Uh, you know, we have about seven more questions at least in the in the Q and A. And if there's a way for us to get your you know quick take answer on that, that we can then publish out to the audience um, who attended today, that'd be great. Um, we'll see what we can do. I'll talk to you offline. But thank you so much for joining us today. And Thank you again to our sponsors. Um, really appreciate you guys coming together to help us with this so that we can offer it free and open to the public. We will have a little bit more time and leave the, the room open so that you can network and talk to some of your friends, meet some of the folks that you haven't met. Um, so we'll go back into that conversation mode. You'll be at your tables and you can, you can do that. Um, and, and please take some time but, and go visit the sponsors banner. Click on the banner and say hello to them that way. Um, show them some love for what they're doing for us. We really appreciate it. Katie, thank you for your time here. We'll go back to conversation mode now, folks.